What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Duke Wisdom Podcast, episode 40. We made it to 40. Doing pretty good, I think. Uh, thanks to everybody who's who's asking where the episodes are, who's giving uh, suggestions for the podcast. Uh, I'm really stoked for for the opportunity to to do this and to have people listening. And I'm super excited for the possibilities of what this can become this off season, heading into next year. Because you know, I, I've had a, as many people as I've had listening to this podcast, just me talking into a pretty low quality mic. So, you know, thanks for that. Uh, I think that as as I graduate now and head into my next stages uh, of life and career, hopefully I'll be able to dedicate more time to this, uh, not being a student uh, during the summer and be able to get better equipment, coordinate guests and such from within the Duke Wisdom Network and also from outside it with some of the other prominent names um, that cover Duke basketball or college basketball in general and, and have them on and, and, and talk shop. I think it can be something that, that, that is really meaningful for, for this community of fans and, and this college basketball community. And, and just thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening and, and making me feel like I'm not just talking to a window, basically that I have people who, care about what I have to say. I think that 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 means a lot to me because I, I think everybody can relate to being this massive basketball fan and you're just constantly talking about uh, uh, talking about it and you have friends, you have loved ones and everything, but they can only understand your uh, your your psychotic nature as a fan to a certain degree. <laughs> and and so for me this is this is a a big 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 outlet and opportunity. And with that being said, let's let's get into some of my ravings. Let's <laughs> let's get into it, you know what I'm saying? Um so this the, the title of this one's decisions decisions decisions. That's the name of the game in in April, obviously. And since we last talked, I think the last episode was pretty much the Mark Mitchell episode. Mitch, Mark had entered the transfer portal as had Christian Reeves. We've had uh, a few more decisions, a handful of decisions. So I think I mentioned it on the last episode that I had to make, you know, edits and graphics in advance for every single player, for all 11 scholarship players. I had to make a he's back or a he's entering the portal or a draft or whatever it was. There was only one player that I didn't make a option for him leaving edit. And that was Sean Stewart, <laughs> Shout out to Sean Stewart. Uh, but outside of him, you know, I had to have those options, right? Um, I still had a, you know, an inkling of where I thought everybody might end up landing, but I had to cover all the bases. So I've been at weird places when decisions have officially dropped and I've had to get those, <laughs> those graphics out. I've been, you know, at a, at a friend's, uh, graduation, like art gallery. I've been at, uh, on a drive actually to, to Cape Lookout <laughs> on, on, on the coast, uh, for another story I'm doing. And so I've been at these places and I've been trying to uh, to get these graphics up. I'm glad that I was able to make all those in advance. And some of the decisions that have happened, uh, obviously Duke had its, its end of the season banquet on Thursday. And normally I would go to that. I've been on the lower court part for dinner before. I've, I've just been in the upper parts. I go to the banquet pretty frequently. Uh, I wasn't able to go to that because I was busy with those other things that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. So I wasn't able to to attend this year, but you know there were people talking about how they they put up the graphics and the video board about uh, the four graduates and thanking them. You know Ryan, Spencer, Jeremy, and and Jalen. And when I heard that, I sort of took it as well. It seems like our our thoughts have been confirmed about Jeremy Roach. Jeremy Roach not returning. That's still not technically <laughs> technically official. Uh, but it might as well be uh, that Jeremy Roach will not be returning next season. Uh, I think that's pretty much just the assumption that we're running under at, at the moment. But official words, not technically out. Uh, but And then Jalen Blakes, it was announced that he had graduated after three years. My official projection on Blakes is that he would return to Duke. And that was kind of predicated on the fact that I believed he would want to get a degree from Duke University and there wouldn't be a point in transferring. He needs to get that degree from Duke. But once once I learned that he was graduating in three years, it became pretty obvious that 
the opposite would be true. He had that degree and he was going to go ahead and enter the transfer portal for his last year of eligibility. Can't blame him. I understand the decision. Uh, gonna gonna miss having Jalen Blake's. Uh, he's 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 got that dog in him, man. He's an absolute workhorse in the weight room on the court. You you see his dedication. You see his energy that he brings to the game. And uh, I always likened him to Jordan Goldwire in a lot of ways. And now he he's he's taken the ultimate comparison step by becoming a graduate transfer like Goldwire did. Um, but Jalen Blake's was one of the last two remaining scholarship players to play under both Coach K and John Shire. And assuming that Jeremy Roach is also not back, there are no more scholarship players that played under both coaches. Actually, the last player period to play under both coaches remaining will be will be Stanley Borden. Um, but J, J- Bug's gone. Uh, I wish him nothing but the best, just as I wish nothing but the best for Mark and for Christian and all three of the guys entering the portal. Um, speaking of Mark, it seems like there's a lot of momentum for him to head to to K State, which I think is a pretty solid landing spot for him back in his 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 home state. Um, but moving away from sort of the transfer decisions, we also had some some NBA draft decisions, two NBA draft decisions that weren't terribly surprising, might I add. Uh, Jared McCain, obviously, I think it was Friday, uh, entered the the NBA draft. Uh, was very thankful of of all the Duke fans and and everybody who gave him support. I think there are a lot of Duke fans who would consider Jared McCain one of their favorite one and done players of of all time at Duke, if not one of their favorite players. Period. Just such a a fantastic personality, great guy, uh, easy to love uh, as a fan, and will will be sorely missed um, on the court and off the court. Uh, as will Kyle Filipowski. Uh, Kyle Filipowski later that day entered the NBA draft, the the consensus All American for Duke, the first kind of golden boy of the of the Shire era, the first best player under John Shire. So new chapters emerging as Filipowski and McCain enter the draft. Both are are uh, potential lottery picks in the NBA draft, and I'm sure that. As the summer goes on and as we approach the NBA draft, we go through the combine. I'll be talking more about Jared and Kyle and where they might land in the NBA draft and that kind of thing. But right now, it's big picture looking at what Duke's roster looks like next year. We know we're down uh, probably the team's four four best players or at least four of the top five players from this year's team. Uh, And that's tough. However, we did get two other decisions uh, I, I had a a, a clip. I've, been, I've started to clip the podcast and put it up on like Twitter and Instagram, and I think that's a good decision. It gets a lot of interaction, and I appreciate that interaction. Uh, and I chose a clip that I, I knew would be a little controversial, me talking about the fact that I thought Duke could only win the national championship if they had Tyrese Proctor back. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Tyrese Proctor's back. He's back for his junior season. Uh, presumably, he'll be a team captain for a second straight year. He'll be the uh, most tenured Blue Devil on the roster. Uh, that's all alone, given Jalen Blake's decision. So he's he he's the most ten- well. I mean, maybe not all alone actually, because I get Jaden Shoot still has a decision whether to transfer or not, and if he doesn't, then Shoot will be been a, around as long, but certainly would not have had the same time and role uh, on the floor that Proctor's had, uh, especially with being a team captain already as a sophomore. So Tyrese Proctor is back. And you know, and, and I had a lot of people pushing back on that 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 notion that Tyrese had to return for Duke to win a national title. And my thought process was just like, you know, can you, are there players as good as Tyrese? Yeah. But like in terms of fit for Duke and needing a guy who's been around to be a locker room presence and a leader on the floor, that's not something you can just replicate through the transfer portal. And that's something that is absolutely 100% necessary to win a national championship. Duke's not going to roll up in the next season with six freshmen, three sophomores, and, and like three transfers and win the national championship. I, I mean, it's just not going to happen. And so to have Tyrese Proctor back means everything. It means everything. He is arguably uh, one of the, the most important players. I mean, he's not arguably one of the most important players on next year's team. He just is. And he's arguably the most important. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to make that argument, but he's certainly right there at the top. Uh, and he's gonna he's gonna be crucial for this Duke team, both both as a, a leader in the locker room, a leader on the floor, 
and a floor general setting up those new talented freshmen uh, for looks in the, on the front court and in the back court, and he himself making strides. And the comparison I want to make for Tyrese Proctor is Wendell Moore Jr. I think there's a lot of sentiment about about how well he didn't bring a national title in his first two years. What makes this year different? You know, he he fell off. He's not who we thought he was. Well, look at Wendell Moore. Wendell Moore was a five star recruit coming in. He started as a freshman, like Proctor, averaged single digits. You know, was up and down, but showed a lot of promise. And coming into Wendell Moore's sophomore year, this might be lost on some people. Uh, he was kind of thought to be he was going to be the best or the second best player on the team, probably coming into his sophomore year. A lot of people had, you know, first team all ACC expectations of Wendell Moore as a sophomore. They were thinking 15, 16 points a game for Wendell Moore as a sophomore. Uh, he certainly had it in him. And then he really regressed as a, he, he got better, but seeming but he missed his expectations so drastically that it seemed like he regressed. But he didn't actually but he did come off the bench for some games this sophomore year, and he really shouldn't have. He averaged like nine points a game and was nowhere near Duke's best player as a sophomore. And then everybody kind of was like, you know, well, what's Wendell really going to do for us as a junior? They, they, they didn't have a lot of faith in Wendell Moore coming into his junior year. Wendell Moore had been on mock drafts in the first round of NBA mock drafts as an underclassman, and that had seemed to that opportunity seemed to evaporate. He was nowhere to be seen on, on mock drafts entering his junior season. But Wendell Moore ended up having a very poised junior season. He became a very consistent presence for Duke, a consistent three-point shooter, uh, even a floor general, even had a triple-double early in the season. Uh, didn't average a, a crazy number of points, but averaged 13 points a game uh, for a Final Four team. Ended up being an All-ACC player and winning the National Small Forward of the Year award. And he ended up earning himself a... a first round draft status and getting drafted 26th by Minnesota. And that's kind of how I, I, I urge Duke fans to view Tyrese Proctor. View him like Wendell Moore. Freshman year, not so great, uh, but good starter, shows a lot of promise, raises ex- expectations for year two, doesn't meet those expectations. People get down on him. He falls out of mock drafts, but he comes back junior year not to have this explosive first team All-American season, but to have this fantastic season for a Final Four team and earn his way back into the first round of mock drafts, be a consistent veteran pillar. That's how I urge people to view Tyrese Proctor, and that's what I think Tyrese Proctor will be next season. What was that Duke team in 2022 without Wendell Moore? They weren't a Final Four team. They weren't a team that could win the national title without Wendell Moore, and that's my point with Tyrese Proctor. This, this team is now a team that can win the national title. Without him, I don't think that was the case. Um, so Proctor's back, but not only is Tyrus Proctor back, I actually just got done listening to the new Brotherhood podcast. Ryan Young is still podcast boy, even even post post Duke player status. He's uh, uh still hosting the Brotherhood pod. Love love hearing Ryan's voice. Um, gonna 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 miss him being a player for this program. Even you know some people are haters. They're gonna say he's not the the best player in the world, and yeah, that's certainly true. But I think he's been a great a great guy for this program and there's no doubt about it. And he's been one of the most meaningful transfers Dukes ever had. And certainly in the transfer portal era, I think he has been the best transfer Dukes ever had. So uh, I want to, I mean, transfer portal has only been like six years. So the other guy coming back, obviously was in that episode is Caleb Foster and Caleb Foster was just talking about how, you know, he couldn't imagine playing anywhere else. And he's he's made this decision a while ago, and it really wasn't even a decision for him because he never would have transferred. You know, he's a thousand percent committed to Duke, uh, and this is where he wants to be. And he can't imagine going through the process of of transferring. And Tyrese Proctor kind of echoed that sentiment. And so to me, it, it seems like Duke has two players who who get along, have similar mindsets, similar goals um, in the backcourt next year. It kind of feels like, yeah, there was this this behind the scenes. There were some some maybe some contrasting chemistry issues a little bit, maybe on on last year's team. And I'm thinking those are going to be largely alleviated this year um, with with Proc getting along with the returning sophomores. You know, obviously the most important guy that he'll be around is Caleb Foster and the bat starting backcourt with him. But not only Caleb, but also Sean and. It seems like TJ is going to be sticking around. That's not official or anything, but 
with TJ Power as well. And it, and it feels like those are the main returners. And then maybe Jaden Shoot. And, and that's the four or maybe five guys that'll be back from next year's team outside of, you know, Stanley's walk on. And so that's it. And then you bring in the freshmen and whatever transfers Duke's going to bring in. But uh, they're easier to integrate maybe into. I, into chemistry, I'm I don't, I'm not sure. It seemed to work well with the freshmen into chemistry this past season. So if they can get the freshmen to buy in with 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 Proc and the three returning sophomores and maybe and and shoot and and that's that seems like they've got a good thing going chemistry wise and and they've got some driven players who who have goals. Man, I mean these freshmen are absolutely relentless. But looking forward to seeing a Tyrese Proctor, Caleb Foster backcourt i can't stress how important it is to have both of those guys as returning starting pieces uh in in the backcourt and i think that foster will see a a a a stark increase in scoring and production and i think proctor will be incredibly important and having two your two vets uh if, if that's what we're calling caleb two vets be guys who are in the backcourt, I think is really important because those backcourt players are are really necessary to be vets, to be poised. I think that that that's a really important thing to have, and so I'm I'm looking forward to having Caleb and Tyrese. That's kind of how I've thought this was going to play out. I, I figured that the two guys that would return in the backcourt would be Caleb and Tyrese. I, I missed the mark on a couple of projections, um, and one of those was Blake's because I didn't know about the graduating in three years thing. Um, but let's, let's get into, into that freshman class and then into kind of more roster construction. I think that's how I'll, I'll, I'll keep going with this one. Want to join a community of Duke accounts, publishing news, theories, and predictions on Duke athletics. Join the Duke wisdom network. Just go to dukewisdom.org slash join network today and fill out the form with your name and social media. Or you can DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. Become a part of the community of Duke fans publishing their takes today. Again, that's dukewisdom.org slash join network to DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. Let's talk about Nike Hoop Summit. Nike Hoop Summit happened uh, this weekend and Duke had four players playing in it on Team World. They had Common Model Watch and then on Team USA, they had Cooper Flag, Isaiah Evans, Patrick Ngongba. Uh, and Patrick Patrick couldn't play because he's still, you know, rehabbing that injury. So he wasn't able to touch the floor. But still a very cool thing to know that they had four guys playing in that game. That means a lot about Duke's upcoming freshman class. I don't have to tell you about how heralded these recruits are. I think at this point we're past the talking about their five stars there. They, you know, ooh, look at how hyped they are. I, I think it, we're at the point now where we talk about how they genuinely fit in at Duke and what can we, we what can we realistically expect from them next season? We're at that point, I think, now. For me, we saw some minutes for Isaiah Evans uh, kind of in, in the it, early in the game, but also more so his production was sort of in the waning uh, times of the game. We got a really cool still of him dunking and Cooper Flag, you know, jumping up with him. Uh, in a very Zion RJ esque moment, and I love that one. That's got locked screen material. If you've seen that picture, you know what I'm talking about. It's such an amazing moment, and I and I love the dynamic those guys have with each other. Uh, I think it's going to be really crucial their chemistry for next season as well. And I love that, and I love how Common went after Cooper and like blocked his shot and stuff. That that was big as well. Um, but Isaiah, for me. Again, I've talked about it, a skilled offensive player uh, to, to earn a starting spot for Isaiah Evans. He's going to have to prove that he's a, a capable defender at the small forward. Obviously, he can't. He's not going to be defending at the shooting guard as a starter because Duke's got Proctor and Foster. So he's going to have to guard some some bigger guys. Uh, I'm not just talking about height. I'm obviously talking about size. And he's baby Ingram for a reason. He's Brandon Ingram, but he's smaller than Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram was very, very, very skinny, but... He could sort of get away with it because he was like pushing, you know, six, nine or so with, I think, a little more length, uh, obviously, than, than Evans had. So he he could get away with it where I'm not sure Isaiah can yet. He's he's a tough guy, though, man. He's a really tough guy. And so I would not be surprised to see him kind of overachieve defensively at, at, at moments. Uh, I'd love to see him earn that starting spot. I'm just not ready to give it up. I think the other four starting spots seem clear to me. Although one of them I will talk about in a, in a moment 
it might have a little bit of an asterisk next to it. But uh, I, I like Isaiah's game. Uh, he's just a scorer. He's a pure Hooper man. And I love when he, when he claps. And there's that one, there's that one video, you know, uh, of his coach talking about, you know, when Isaiah claps, you know, something's about to go down. Like he means business at that point. Lo- love that guy. And um, I'll talk about Cooper Flag next. Cooper Flag got in a little bit of a foul trouble in that first half, scoring six, but hitting some difficult mid-range shots, showing off his range from three, getting to the rim, scoring on the fast break. Uh, Cooper Flag is a dynamic player that can score at every level, and he is Duke's best player. And I know one of the the guys calling the game was like, you know, Cooper Flag's not necessarily a, a score. Uh, I don't expect him to average 15 points a game for Duke next year, and I hope he does. <laughs> I don't think Duke's going to do very well if Cooper Flag doesn't average 15 points a game next season, uh, unless they have like four or five guys all averaging around 14 or so, and it's just a really evenly distributed scoring effort, which wouldn't be bad at all. Um, that would actually be pretty good, but you know, we'll see about that. But he's kind of talking smack about Cooper how he wasn't playing like his normal self, and then Coop Coop lit him up, 19 points, 11 boards. Very good game for Cooper Flag. Duke will be dictated by his play. He is Duke's best player next year. I have no doubt about that. Um, no one really should have any doubts about that. He's a fantastic player. His motor's uh, unreal. He's got just a heck of a drive as a winner. I maintain that I still don't know that I've ever seen Cooper Flag lose a basketball game. And so, you know, that's a heck of a player to have coming into your program. Um, we know what we're getting from Coop. We know he's a starter. We know starting with him is Proctor and Foster. As I mentioned, that small forward role is very much uh, an asterisk or slash power forward. It depends on how you want to play Cooper Flag. I'm of the opinion that Coop should kind of be at the power forward because I think his his ability as a help side defender and help side blocker in the paint is or the weak uh, kind of a weak side uh, shot blocker is is so valuable that you don't want to throw that away and put him at the three. And I think having him as a help for common is extremely valuable. I loved I, I think I'd prefer to play him at the four. And honestly, I think John would, too. John likes playing a little smaller. So I think John would prefer to play him at the four. I think the the question mark is at the three for for Duke right now, uh, starting wise. And then, you know, uh, uh, arguably, there's a little bit of a question mark on Common Malawatch. Common Malawatch is is raw. And you very much saw that at the Nike Hoop Summit. It's not just that he hasn't been playing for a long time and that he's raw in general. It's also that he's adjusting to uh, an American brand of basketball. You know, he's been playing uh, in Africa and he's been playing, you know, these FIBA style rules and so it's an adjustment to play to play not just nba basketball i think he'd be better suited and better adjusted for nba basketball actually i think he needs to adjust to what college basketball is going to look like college basketball looks a lot different than than those brands of ball uh but commons obviously got the tools he had a thunderous dunk he had some blocks he also missed a layup he also missed a dunk he also missed some passes he also, you know, got in the air on pump fakes a little too easily and fouled. Um, there were some clear things that that Malawatch is just he's he's raw, man. He's really raw. Uh, and he's going to see a similar curve, if not even steeper curve than Derek Lively. He's a much more diverse talent than Derek was. Like he can go out and shoot the ball, put the ball on the floor, that kind of thing. So I think Commons got a much higher upside. but. I will say that Common is raw and can Duke depend on him to be this kind of pillar of of excellence in the middle from day one? Probably not. No, especially because he's going to be playing in the Olympics this summer. He'll join the team late. I would say no, that, that won't be the case for Duke. I think Common's going to be a work in progress, but I think he should start from day one. I really do think that. I, I think that Duke shouldn't mess around. I think he should be the starting center and let him learn trial by fire on the floor. I think that's the best way to go about it. And I've seen some pushback about this because obviously the, your backup center is Patrick and Patrick's got an asterisk next to him because of injury rehab as well and injury history. There's another big off the, the bench though that's Sean Stewart, who I think is going to be ready to put in some work next year, man. As a shot blocker and an absolute menace, I think Sean Stewart will be, will be ready to be Duke's sixth or seventh man and, and play a vital role on next year's team. So let's not look past Sean Stewart. I mean, everybody wanted to give Sean minutes this year. Let's not strip him uh, of those opportunities already next year. I think he's going to be great. And I've heard a lot of talk about, well, Duke needs this veteran big man. 
I wouldn't be opposed to getting a, vet- a veteran big man to play sort of Ryan Young minutes per game uh, and sort of mediate the beginning of the season for Common. If Common's struggling, you then have a veteran player, preferably one who's a, a really good defender that you can put in the game and, and he can hold down Fort for however many minutes he needs to, but also a guy who's not so good that that he he has to be in rotation by March, like deeply in rotation by March, because I just don't think there's a need for that. I think what people are forgetting is, you know, obviously you want backups and guys who are competent to play in case of injuries. I think that's important. But I don't think that's going to be much of a problem for Duke. Duke's got a really talented roster even right now before they get any transfers. And so for me, it's like, let's not go overboard. We don't need to get two or three high level transfers. We need maybe one guy who can play deep rotation, a second guy who can be in games rotationally early season. And I don't know that a third one's necessary at all. Uh, that's that's my thought process on it, because the, the way I view the roster right now is Brock and then Foster, the starter at the three is going to be either that the higher highest level transfer they bring in. Uh, or Isaiah Evans, and then Cooper and, and Common, and then off the bench you're gonna see you're gonna see like Sean Stewart, and then either Evans or that transfer or the highest level transfer Duke brings in, and TJ Power, and then Khan and Darren and Patrick, and dude, that's eleven playable players, and then that's not even counting Jaden Shoot if he doesn't enter the portal, that would be twelve playable players. Uh, and and for me at that point, that means that the 13th roster spot in that situation with Jaden Shoot goes to some random transfer who's probably never going to play. Uh, without Jaden Shoot, you can probably get another. You can probably get another transfer who will play a little a little bit. Like I mentioned, a guy who can play kind of mid level minutes, Ryan Young role. Um, outside of that, you do not need a third one. I think on in either instance, there is not a need for three transfers. Two is the max. Uh, one is the necessity, two is the max. That's kind of how I I view this. And it depends on how confident John is in, in common. I've seen a lot of uh, talk about needing a, a backup point guard in the portal, which I understand that that thought process because, you know, without Jeremy, without Jalen, you've basically got two guys that can run the one on the whole roster and they're both going to be starters. Tyrese Proctor and Caleb Foster. And so what happens if one of them goes down? I understand that. Honestly, I really do get that. And so that's why for me, it's like, well, you could maybe use one of those transfer slots on a on a veteran point guard, but it can't be a high level veteran point guard. You know what I'm saying? Because that guy probably isn't going to touch the floor much. He's really just kind of uh, insurance policy for an injury uh, at the end of the day. And he plays a few minutes early in the season, probably, but by like mid January, that guy's probably out of the rotation. If pro as long as proc and foster are healthy, that dude's probably not playing at all. So you got to find like, again, a mid-level transfer, not nobody. Duke's not going to be able to land any like super high quality guys. That that starting small forward role could potentially uh, net a, a high level wing player. Um, but I, I doubt that they're going to be able to get that veteran point guard is going to have to be somebody who doesn't really expect to play a whole lot. That's that's the end of the day. If that's if they're going after that, that's going to be somebody that doesn't expect to play a whole lot um, because that's what Duke has time for. Because I fully expect Proc and, and, and Foster to be playing 33 plus minutes a game pretty much the whole season. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of time. And it's like, well, when and, and the solution is that if they're both healthy, you don't even have to play anyone else at point guard. And so, well, Proc comes out, just don't take Caleb out, play him at the point guard. And then when Caleb needs to come out, put Proc back in. So if like both of them aren't in, at least one of them's in the game at all times, basically. I do think Duke's going to need somebody from the portal to, 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 to run point, at least in like garbage time or something. I don't know because otherwise you're just going to be running like um, a shooting guard at the one, which I guess isn't out of the question. It's an interesting uh, debate. I do think that that would be useful, but I don't think it needs to be a really high level player. That's, that's, that's pushing rotation because I, I see it. People talking about Duke needs these three transfers to compete for a title. They need three transfers. And I'm like, there's just not room for three transfers in this rotation. 
I, I, I really get the fact that, and I know, trust me, I know that all six of these freshmen aren't going to be playing major rotation minutes. Absolutely not. At least two of them aren't going to play major rotation minutes, maybe even three of them. Uh, but even if you only had three of them playing major rotation minutes, I, I firmly believe that Proctor's playing major rotation, as is Foster Stewart. Probably TJ's pushing into that as well. And so that's four returners, three freshmen. That's seven guys. That's pretty much your March rotation right there. That's pretty much March. Uh, add an eighth guy to that. It's probably either Patrick or, uh, you know, another another transfer or something. Becoming that eighth guy. Yeah, there's just not going to be space for that many transfers in the rotation. Uh, they might get three if shoot were to leave. Uh, if shoot doesn't leave, they only literally can get two, I think. Um, so that two would be the number if shoot is sticks around. If he doesn't, they'll probably get a third, but that third guy is not going to be a major player. He's going to be more of a, of a kale catchings, but maybe a tiny bit larger role. You know, that that's, that's kind of how I, I view that, that, that role if it opens up. But anyway, I, I think we're, we're seeing the roster come into, to more shape and that'll continue as the day goes on, as I think we'll pretty much finalize uh, the roster outside of the transfers in the next few days, we'll, we'll know exactly who's returning, exactly who's not, and exactly who's coming in as freshmen. And the, the remaining question mark will become the transfer portal. So that's where we stand right now. Um, decisions, decisions, decisions. A lot of them are wrapping up, but there are still certainly question marks. Thanks so much for listening. As always, we're 40 episodes into this thing somehow. Thank you guys. For supporting and listening make sure you subscribe and follow the podcast wherever you're listening and i'll talk to you guys later